Welcome to Turkish American Hour. This is Semahat Demir. Today we are visiting Dr. Esma Akın, Associate Professor of Radiology. Dr. Akın is the Chief of Nuclear Medicine at the Department of Radiology, George Washington University Hospital. Dr. Akın, thanks for hosting us today. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm fine. Can you give us some information about your background and about your specialty? Uh, I'm actually a radiologist by training, but I subspecialize in nuclear medicine, and mostly what I do is di- diagnostic imaging. How did you get interested in becoming a medical doctor and a radiologist? Well, actually, uh, I was interested in uh, medicine and wanted to become a doctor from a very early age. I had a lot of doctors in my family, uh, not my immediate family, but my extended family, and my pediatrician was a good role model. Um, I did get exposed uh, to the medical profession from a very early age because of uh, my uncles and aunts. And so in a way you could say it was in the water for me. It was a natural uh, choice. Um, when I, uh, after I went to medical school, I got really uh, interested in uh, seeing the disease um, on film. And I realized that uh, what a radiologist does behind the scenes is actually vital to how we treat patients. And uh, there's a new challenge in every case, uh, and there is a, a, a tremendous potential to help people. Um, so that is how I got interested in radiology. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I got interested in nuclear medicine because it, it really is uh, medical imaging in its highest technical form. Um, and I am interested in technology. So um, in a way, it was very, very challenging and interesting for me to just look at the images and try to figure out what they were. Where did you get your medical training? I was born and raised in Ankara, Turkey. I went to medical school in Hacettepe University School of Medicine. Um, after I went to me- finish my medical school, I did uh, come to Washington, D.C. to do my residency, uh, right after, actually. And uh, I ended up spending uh, about seven years and doing two residencies in Georgetown University Hospital uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, I specialized in both radiology and nuclear medicine and got board certified in both separately. It was a long extended residency for me, period for me, but I really felt that uh, doing both separately um, really put me in an advantage in the field. What are the standard medical imaging technologies the doctors are using today? Uh, When you say radiology, uh, diagnostic imaging, it really spans a wide range of uh, modalities. Uh, You you can start with regular x-rays. Everybody knows what regular x-rays are. Um, And ultrasound, which doesn't uh, employ radiation, actually. It just uh, uses sound waves. Uh, MRI uses uh, magnets and uh, tissue magnetization, uh, again, without radiation. Um, And then you come to the more, uh, you know, invasive, I should say, radiation-wise diagnostic modalities like uh, computerized tomography, CT scans, um, and of course we have and geographic procedures, which is interventional radiology today is a very big field. Uh, and of course, uh, my favorite is nuclear medicine, um, also employs radioisotopes um, and, uh, you know, really, really is very helpful in non-invasive diagnosis, uh, employing radiology of many, many uh, cancers, many tumors, and also cardiac uh, problems. Can you define nuclear medicine for our audience again and also talk about some of the innovations in nuclear medicine? Sure. Uh, Nuclear medicine has a big name, uh, but it actually essentially means uh, uh, physiologic imaging. What we do is we use radioisotopes, very small molecules with a low dose of radiation, and we either give these radioisotopes to people by mouth or we inject uh, the isotopes from their veins. And what the the isotopes do is they are tagged to very tissue and organ specific substances that basically travel in your body uh, and light up in our scans like a light bulb. Um, So what we can see actually is how tissue functions, how organs function and why they fail functioning uh, and we can basically image that so it's in in reality it is functional imaging not anatomic imaging like x-rays are but we can actually follow these isotopes through the organ functions can you show us some examples uh, sure I can talk about examples we uh, first of all we use uh, nuclear medicine in uh, 
what we call a non-invasive cardiac angiogram. If somebody had a heart attack, we could figure out what vessels in their heart is blocked uh, without having to do an angiogram. And that's a very uh, big start for uh, working somebody up for a cardiac disease. Um, we can figure out if someone has cancer, it, if it has spread to distant organs, uh, or how active is the cancer. Everybody can see the cancer on a CT scan or on, a, on an x-ray. Um, but we don't really know uh, how much of this cancer is very aggressive, how much of it is not aggressive. Uh, is the size really proportional to the aggressiveness of the cancer? Uh, in nuclear medicine, we can do that. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, one of our uh, new innovations in nuclear medicine is PET CT scans or PET scans. And PET scans are, in, in uh, reality, just radio-labeled sugar molecules that we give to patients uh, intravenously. and um, they travel through the body, and they uh, get taken up, the word is taken up, by very cancerous tissue that have increased sugar consumption. So normal tissue has sugar consumption. Our brain has sugar consumption. Our heart has sugar consumption. Uh, but these are in physiologic levels. Cancerous tissue has increased glucose use. Um, when we give radioactive, slightly radioactive sugar molecules to patients, if there is cancer in their body, it will go to that tissue and it will light up on our skin. This is our camera that we perform our PET CT scans on. And what we do here is basically the patient goes in here, um, the table moves into the gantry, the images are acquired, and the table moves out of the gantry in all it takes about 20 minutes from beginning to end. Uh, so 20 minutes of not moving so much is really what we require, what we really need. And if we, um, whenever we give the radioactive glucose, uh, it's really given through the vein, but we can superimpose those images on regular CAT scan images uh, using the iodine dye as well. And that is done with uh, that injector over there. is a scan here um, of a patient. Well, this patient here uh, has had a PET scan, what we call a PET scan. Actually, it is a PET CT scan. Um, it is a functional image superimposed on an anatomic image. This is the functional part, and this is the, anato this is the anatomic part uh, superimposed on the functional part. Um, this patient has a tumor that has unfortunately spread to her bones. You can see it here and spread to her chest wall. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a very aggressive type of thyroid tumor, uh, which is usually not so aggressive. So in her case, we're able to pinpoint exactly where uh, these tumor foci are and basically tailor the radiation treatment or uh, any targeted localized chemotherapy to those areas specifically. If we need a biopsy, we know exactly where to go. It, there may be a mass or there may be a cancer that is not necessarily as active as another part. For example, if we go through this part uh, in the lung and, and take a biopsy there, that may not be as active as this part. Uh, so now when we do a functional imaging, we know where exactly the tumor is most active and then we can biopsy that area. So it really does help in diagnosis and it helps in following up patients. For example, after this patient gets uh, uh, the necessary treatment that she gets, uh, we will then do another uh, PET scan uh, at, at some point um, to see just how well she responded to chemotherapy. These very bright spots are not going to be as bright if she responded well to chemotherapy. If she hasn't, we will stop that chemotherapy and change it to a different regimen so that the toxic treatment doesn't have to continue. We can stop in time soon enough. Uh, with non-functional anatomic imaging, unfortunately, you're not able to do that very, very easily. Um, things that look big may not necessarily be active. Things that are very, very small may be very, very active tumor foci. This is just one thing that we do. Another method that we use, or an innovative technology that we use, which is relatively new, uh, and we do do this at George Washington University Hospital, um, is yttrium-labeled microspheres um, used for treatment of metastatic cancer to the liver. If someone has uh, bad cancer that has spread to the liver, this usually means either 
that part of the liver has to be resected, surgically taken out, or uh, patient has to undergo tremendous amounts of heavy chemotherapy or something called chemoembolization where the chemotherapy is delivered to the liver lesion uh, specifically. Chemoembolization sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, there is a new method uh, that basically employs very tiny glass microbeads that are covered with radiation. The radioisotope is called yttrium-90, uh, and it is basically uh, made to cover these microbeads, um, which are then injected directly to the patient's tumor. How do we do this? We don't have to operate on the patient. Uh, we specifically access the tumor itself from the groin with interventional radiology, and we can deliver a very targeted dose of yttrium-90 labeled microspheres, uh, and we really get great tumor kill with that. So that is a very new, innovative, cutting-edge approach to metastatic uh, treatment of any liver cancer, really, be it primary or metastatic liver cancer. Um, and we do do this at George Washington University Hospital, uh, and it's one of the rare centers in the United Sta States that um, do this. What are the advances in basic science that will impact nuclear medicine in the long term, in the future? That is a very good question. And um, the answer is targeted treatments, treatments that are targeted to the patient, that are individualized to the patient, and not cookbook treatments, uh, not generalized treatments. Every tumor acts differently. Uh, every cancer acts differently. Um, every cancer acts differently over time, and one type of cancer acts differently in different people. Uh, two people who have the same breast cancer may not have the breast cancer turn out the same way, or may not have the breast cancer act the same way. Uh, some people have positive receptors. Some people have negative receptors. That means that some people res will respond to certain drugs and some people will not respond to the same drugs. Uh, so in nuclear medicine, what we're looking at very carefully is molecular imaging. We're looking at diagnostic and therapeutic modalities using molecular imaging and, and nanotechnology. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, really individualize uh, the scanning and diagnostic scanning of the patients, which will then lead to individualization of treatment of these patients. Uh, I think that this is the direction that we have to go, uh, especially in, in the environmental factors are uh, so much against us these days. Let us also educate the public about the radiation exposure. Are there any risks during these medical exams? Uh, that again is a very good question. Um, while we try to diagnose disease, uh, unfortunately, we may actually cause disease. Uh, all of, almost all of the modalities in nuclear medicine involve radiation. Not all of the modalities in radiology involve radiation, like ultrasound or MRI do not involve radiation. But some of the disease cannot be diagnosed with those modalities. Sometimes we will have to use radiation in order to be able to treat the, the illness. Um, the key to that is uh, that we adhere to uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission guidelines uh, in our hospital and in every hospital uh, across the United States. Uh, and the guidelines are basically uh, as low as reasonably achievable radiation use, what we call ALARA. Uh, first of all, every doctor has to educate their patient about exactly how much radiation they're going to be exposed to. Uh, how much radiation uh, are they allowed to expose to throughout their lifetime? Has it reached that limit? Has it not reached that limit? These are very important um, educational guidelines that the, the doctor and the patient have to talk about. Um, having said that, uh, if a patient does have cancer, our main goal becomes finding and curing it. Uh, so really, uh, the fear of radiation should not deter us from doing the right test or ordering the right test or as a patient undergoing the right test. It's just that we have to be aware uh, and we have to gently image. And uh, there's a very big emphasis uh, today on gently imaging and reducing radiation dose as much as possible uh, in every scan. Do you have any recommendations to students who are interested in becoming medical doctors and radiologists? 
Well, uh, becoming a radiologist is really a very specialized uh, uh, aspect of medicine. So, you know, one has to really like it. And some people uh, like a lot of patient interaction, which a radiologist does have a lot of patient interaction, but we do not tend to have the same patients over a long time. Hopefully our patients will get diagnosed, get better, and leave. Um, so uh, first of all, you have to like uh, imaging. Uh, and second, you have to like computers because all, almost all of radiology these days uh, is computerized and uh, we have picture archiving systems that uh, we have to be savvy in knowing how to use. Uh, as far as going into medicine, um, you know, it, it really is a calling more than anything else, uh, I think. Um, it is a profession, yes, but it, it really has to be a calling because, you know, one should not forget that your main goal always is, and your main objective always is to help the next person, to help the other person. Uh, and so I guess if you, you could think of yourself anything other than a doctor, I would not go into medicine. Um, it's a very rewarding field. Uh, it is truly how I think all doctors define themselves as human beings first. Thank you, Dr. Akin. Thank you for sharing general information about radiology and nuclear medicine and the new technologies that are being used. And thank you, you are a very busy person. Thanks for your time from your busy clinic. My pleasure and thank you for having me. This is Semahat Demir. Thank you for watching Turkish American Hour.